space program, where, where they go to all kinds of extremes to try to avoid failures. Because we wanted this thing to work. If we built this huge thing and it didn't work, it would just set back progress instead of setting it forward. Are people becoming obsolete? A giant electronic brain has started cogitating at the University of Pennsylvania. It's made of vacuum tubes, like your radio, and it can add up a column of figures a yard long in a second. It's the world's first electronic computer. Right now, it's solving mathematical problems for the U.S. Army, but who knows, someday a machine like this may check up on your income tax. It had taken three years to build the machine they called ENIAC for electronic, numerical, integrator and computer. It filled a room 50 feet by 30 feet. As well as its 18,000 electronic valves, it had tens of thousands of electrical components and half a million soldered joints. And it could perform 5,000 additions every second. ENIAC created myths. Every fictional computer thereafter would have flashing lights, but these bright lights made of half ping-pong balls were specially fitted for the publicity film. Arthur Burks, a member of the engineering team, masterminded the machine's debut. In the public demonstration of the ENIAC, we computed the trajectory of a shell that took 30 seconds to reach its target. ENIAC computed the trajectory in only 20 seconds, faster than the shell itself traveled. ENIAC was seen as a triumph by its army sponsors, even though it was too late to help win the war. It mattered that the ENIAC wasn't done before the end of the war in some sense, because it would have helped to have done a lot of other things with it. But uh, it was, its great importance lay in starting the computer revolution anyway, and not in doing firing and bombing tables. So in a sense, it didn't matter when it got done. The Coming of Peace released an army of technically trained men and women from military work. The skills they had used on wartime projects like radar could now be turned to this new field of electronic engineering, computer development. Great progress had been made, but there was one major hurdle still to be overcome. The Moore School had laid the groundwork. ENIAC's remarkable speed had convinced people of the value of electronic computing. But much of that advantage was lost when the program had to be changed. There were no manuals at all in those days. They had not yet been written. Some excellent ones were written later, but at that time there was nothing. There was nothing available to us at all except the wiring diagrams of each unit. So some of the professors at Penn helped us to learn how to even read the wiring diagrams and we learned how each accumulator worked from the back, how the multiplier worked, what each tube did. These switches that we turned in the front of the machine would then activate or deactivate the various tubes in the back. Computer programming in 1946 involved setting up to 6,000 switches and then replugging the hundreds of cables connecting different parts of the machine. It was like rebuilding it for each new task. Eckert had been well aware that this needed to change. By the time I had, we had frozen the, uh, the design, uh, we were all completely dissatisfied with it. We had thought of better ways of doing everything that we were doing in it. But here again, the philosophy of it, you're not going to make any progress if you don't stop fooling around and don't get on with the show, had to take precedence. ENIAC worked by manipulating a stream of electronic pulses. So does the modern desktop computer. But in this machine, the instructions too are written in electronic pulses, which can be stored on a disk. Entering the contents of the disk into the computer's memory decides what kind of task the machine can perform. So a new disk changes it from an accountant to a chess player. Or, in a matter of seconds, it can become a mathematician. But such flexibility is only possible because this machine's memory is 12,000 times as big as the memory of the giant ENIAC. The group at the Moore School had realized that storing the program in the memory was the way forward.
and had worked out the theoretical organization for such a machine. It was described in this landmark report, which was widely published, and became the theoretical blueprint for all future computers. The fact that it bore the name of John von Neumann gave it extra authority. America's most distinguished mathematician, he had joined the project as ENIAC neared completion. His involvement was enough to silence any remaining doubters. But the Moore School would lose the race to build this first true ancestor of the modern computer. The group broke up because of a dispute about the ENIAC patent. This had been applied for by Eckert and Morkley at the request of the army and with the Moore School's agreement. But now the university had a new research supremo. He tried to make them give up their rights. We didn't want to do this. And he told us, well, in that case, he'd have to accept our resignation in a month if we didn't do it. And we said, well, there's no use in waiting a month. We're not going to change our minds. So he said, well, take the month anyway. At the end of a month, he came back and said, take a week. And we said it's the same answer. Well, why wait the week? He said, all right, take the week. He came back in a week and said, I'll give me another day. And we, so we waited the week, the, the month, the week and the day and left. They startled everyone by setting up a business, hoping to build computers commercially. But it took time, and they lost their lead. So it was a British radar engineer called Freddie Williams who was the designer of the first stored program computer to operate. He built his machine at Manchester University. The main technical problem had been creating a large enough memory to hold a program and he solved it by an invention of his own. Called the Williams tube, it used the pattern of black and white dots on the surface of a cathode ray tube to hold the electronic information, both the program and the data. The very first program they ran was this one, to identify prime numbers. Manchester University where anyone who urgently wishes to know whether 2 to the power of 127 minus 1 is a prime number or not, can be given the answer by an electronic brain in 25 minutes instead of by a human brain in six months. Impressed by the speed of the machine, the average man was still skeptical about its general usefulness. Just who would want to use these marvels? And what would they use them for? And how easy would they be to operate? The computer itself contains 1,500 valves. The brain at present is only in the experimental stage, the answer being read from a cathode ray tube. Later, an automatic keyboard will type the answer. But within months, at Cambridge University, a less experimental, more practical machine was operating. The first of a series called EDSAC, it began to demonstrate how an electronic computer could be a convenient substitute for the human variety. When we were building the machine, people didn't know very much about it, and I think they thought we were perhaps a little crazy. As soon as the thing began to work, we invited uh, people from other departments to come in and try their hand, in particular graduate students. The graduate students managed to get useful results. They showed them to their research supervisors, and their research supervisors then began to say computers were important. And after a few years, it was everybody in the university was saying computers were important. Programs for the Cambridge machine were written out using a simple code. They were converted to punched tape and then fed into the machine. Scientists from many disciplines soon learned how to prepare programs. These massive number crunchers were so fast that one such machine could do the work of 10,000 human computers with calculators. One physicist worked out that three such machines could do all the scientific computing needed in Britain. But as scientists became familiar with the machine, they discovered that it opened new possibilities. The availability of computers was essential to the development of new sciences, like radio astronomy, which generated masses of data. And in many other branches of science, now huge calculations could be done at speed, the impossible became possible. 
Soon it was realized there would never be enough computing capacity. The scientists were interested in the computer mainly as a tool to widen their horizons. But newspaper headline writers wanted to believe there was more to these machines than that. And they had good authority. Alan Turing, a brilliant mathematician, always saw computers as much more than mere number crunches. The vision Turing had of computers even led him to design one. Pilot Ace, the only more or less complete machine that survives from that era, was based on that design. But Turing hoped to use it for more interesting things than arithmetic. Which is a long time ago. But this was where computers started, electronic computers started. This is one of the first stored program computers. It was designed by a man called Alan Turing, who was in fact a British mathematician. He was involved in cracking codes in the war, in the Second World War, cracking the German codes, yes, in the war. Turing's ideas and computers went back even further than the war. In 1936, he had published a paper on an abstruse mathematical problem. In that paper, written a full decade before computers were built, he wrote about computing machines and demonstrated theoretically that one such machine could, in principle, do any logical task a human could do. Turing realized there was nothing special about computing numbers. It was just one step-by-step -step logical process which manipulated symbols according to certain rules. But there were others. Code breaking, for example. It took symbols, usually letters, and transformed them to unscramble a message. If manipulation of numbers could be mechanized or done by machine, then said Turing, so could manipulation of letters. When war broke out, he had a chance to test his ideas. But the work done at Bletchley Park by Turing and the other code breakers was so secret that its existence would not be revealed until the 1970s. The encoding methods used by the Germans in the Second World War relied on machines. Enigma, the best known, encoded the day-to-day -day traffic of the forces. This was Turing's main area of responsibility. But the most secret of all the messages, including some from Hitler himself, were sent from teleprinters attached to another machine. Called the Lorenz, it had shifting wheels which scrambled the letters in a pattern that was continually changing. Alan Turing worked out one of the logical strategies the code breakers used to attack it. But the task was hopeless. It was much too slow to be useful. The only possibility was to build the rules of their strategy into a machine. Colossus, an extraordinary construction, was a partial embodiment of the computing machine Turing had imagined. It was electronic, and therefore very fast, and it computed not numbers, but code letters. Colossus began operating in 1943, the same year as work on ENIAC began. But whereas the ENIAC's vacuum tubes did arithmetic, Colossus's circuits carried out the logical steps of a code breaker. Colossus broke so many top secret messages that unlike ENIAC, it undoubtedly did help to win the war. It had a less obvious impact than ENIAC on the development of the computer, but it confirmed what Turing had always believed, that a computer was not simply an arithmetic machine. Because of the secrecy surrounding Colossus, Alan Turing's remarkable insight into what a computer could be has only recently been recognized. A celebrated stage play, Breaking the Code, used Turing's words and writings to capture the personality and mannerisms of a brilliant eccentric who was simply years ahead of his time. What we call a program. The computer programs don't necessarily have to have anything at all to do with numbers. A colleague of mine has got our computer to hum tunes. In fact, it once sang jingle bells. We even got it to write love letters. So, doing calculations, humming a tune, writing love letters, all very different tasks.